This is the tale of how I, Nina, came to realize that sometimes the family you select holds greater significance than the one you are born into. My younger sister's laughter could constantly be heard throughout our home when I was a child. Sarah was our parents' golden child, someone who was perfect in their eyes. Me? I was only present. Sarah would dance around the living room, doing an unplanned fashion display for our adoring parents, while I watched. She said, posing, I'm going to be a famous model one day. Dad would give me a hearty clap. That's my girl. Before we realize it, you'll be on magazine covers. I would roll my eyes and go back to my room to read economics or finance books. I realized from a young age that I desired more from life than just physical attractiveness. The gap between Sarah and myself simply got bigger as we got older. She was all about boyfriends and parties, while I was all about my studies. I hoped that my parents would appreciate my efforts when it was time for me to go to college. One evening during dinner, Dad said to me, We'll pay for your first two years. After that, you're on your own. My ears were unbelievable to me. However, Sarah's situation? Will you also need her to pay for her own education? My mother gave me a stern look. Your sister is talented in numerous ways. We must help her achieve her goals. I went to a different city for college, packing my bags. I dedicated myself to my studies throughout the day with the goal of becoming a financial analyst. I worked any jobs I could find at night, including waitressing and tutoring. I saved every dime I made for my tuition. It was not simple. Some evenings, I would weep myself to sleep, feeling worn out and questioning whether it was all worthwhile. But I was not going to give up. I was aware that obtaining an education would allow me to escape the ongoing comparisons and setbacks of my childhood home and have a better life. I was able to pay for my tuition by my third year of savings, and in my final year, I was awarded a full scholarship based solely on my academic standing. Take that, Mom and Dad. Sarah, meantime, was having a great day at home. After only one semester, she had left community college, saying it was not fitting her style. She was still residing in our parents' home and alternating between part-time jobs and modeling assignments when I last heard from her. I chose to remain in the city where I had attended college after graduating. It was the closest thing I'd ever felt to home growing up. I was able to secure employment at a prominent company thanks to my finance degree and the excellent recommendations from my instructors. Neither was it entry level. They offered me a position with actual responsibility since they saw my ability. I pushed myself into work, putting in late evenings and early mornings to prove myself, just as I had done in college. And I did demonstrate my own worth. Nina, you closed a pretty big deal last week, my supervisor called me into his office one day. Keep this up and you'll be looking at a promotion before you know it. I smiled proudly. I had put in a lot of effort to be recognized for my own abilities, rather than by comparison to other people. This is when I first got to know Jake. Our hands came into contact as we reached for the same finance magazine at a nearby coffee establishment. Thoughtless, maybe, but occasionally life does resemble a romantic comedy. I apologize. He responded with a kind grin. You take it. I'm adamant. What if we discussed it over coffee? I made a suggestion, shocking even myself with my audacity. Those coffee dates quickly evolved into dinner dates, weekend trips, and before I knew it, five years had passed. Kind, driven, and supportive of my profession, Jake was all I could have ever dreamed of in a companion. In the interim, my career took off. With every successful transaction came incentives and fresh chances. By the time I turned 32, I had saved enough money for a vehicle payment and an apartment down payment. It wasn't showy, but it was mine since I had worked hard and sacrificed a lot for it. Jake proposed one night in my flat over a handmade dinner. 
I was thinking about how different my life was today from when I was a child, as he put the ring on my finger. I found someone who accepted me for who I was, not for what he thought I should be. We chose to put money aside for a lavish wedding. Ultimately, we had both put in a lot of effort to reach this point. Why not throw a lavish celebration? As we browsed over wedding websites one evening, I said to Jake, I want it to be perfect. A day that shows how far we've come. Jake gave me a tight squeeze. Love, do whatever you want. I put myself into wedding preparation with the same fervor I'd had in my profession because you deserve it. I made mood boards, joined online forums, and subscribed to bridal magazines. We dreamed about our ideal day every free moment. In the meantime, not much had changed in my hometown's way of life. Sarah continued to live with our parents, carrying a baby with her. The father, a man she briefly dated, vanished as soon as he learned of the news. Mom said, Your sister needs our help, on one of our few phone conversations. It's not easy being a single mother. I bit my lip to contain the outrage that Sarah had chosen for herself. Rather, I just uttered, I'm sure she'll figure it out. Mom groaned and said, That's the thing with you, Nana. You've always been so cold towards your family. The charge hurt, but I wasn't going to let it get to me. I'd tried to earn their approval for far too long. I was now concentrating on starting my own family and my own life with Jake. I was looking over some financial statistics at work, one typical Tuesday when my phone buzzed with an email notification. My heart skipped a beat when I saw the sender's name, Sarah. I opened it with a mix of curiosity and trepidation. I felt my blood run cold at what I witnessed. It was our parents' will, scanned into digital form. One thing became quite evident to me as I quickly read through the legalese. Sarah was the only successor to everything our parents had. With trembling hands, I called my mother. The third ring was heard by her. Mom, what's this? Trying to keep my voice calm, I demanded. Why am I not included? The person on the other end of the line hesitated. She said it again in a guarded tone. You're doing great for yourself, Nana. You own a car, an apartment, and a good job. You're not in need of our funds. That's not the point, I countered, raising my voice. I'm also your daughter. Do I not deserve to be rewarded? Mom interrupted, saying, Your sister is struggling. She is a mother by herself. She is unemployed. We are unable to abandon her. For a time we had this conversation, with me attempting to comprehend their choice and Mom standing by it. Ultimately, I hung up feeling betrayed, irate, and totally disregarded. I cut off contact with my family over the course of the following few weeks. I ceased making calls and replying to messages. I convinced myself it was better even though it hurt. With Jake, I had my own family and my own life now. I was no longer in need of their approval. I was beginning to feel comfortable with my choice, though, when life dealt me another blow. Sunday afternoon was calm. My phone rang when Jake and I were kicking back on the couch, browsing wedding venue websites. Once more, it was my mom. In defiance of my better judgment, I replied, Hello? I said. Nina. My mother's voice was strained, almost panicked. I need surgery urgently. The insurance won't cover it all, and we need money. I closed my eyes, bracing myself for what was coming next. How much? 22000 she said quietly. The amount hit me like a punch to the gut. It was a large chunk of what Jake and I had saved for our wedding. I glanced at Jake, who was watching me with concern. I need to think about this, I told her. I'll call you back. After I hung up, I filled Jake in on the situation. He listened thoughtfully, then said, It's your decision, babe, but if it were my parents... I'd want to help. I nodded, torn between my lingering resentment and the desire to do the right thing. Finally, I called my mother back. I can help, I said. 
but I want to do this properly. I'll open a bank account and transfer the money there. You can pay me back gradually. To my surprise, my mother bowed at the idea. No, no, we need cash. Can you bring it in person? Something about her insistence on cash set off alarm bells in my head. Mom, I can't take time off work right now, but I can pay the hospital directly if you give me the details. No, she said quickly. I mean, I don't understand all these modern banking things. Please, Nana, cash would be easiest. I was confused and a little suspicious, but I pushed those feelings aside. This was my mother's health we were talking about. Okay, I said finally. I can't come myself, but Jake can bring the money. Is that all right? She agreed, and we made the arrangements. As I hung up, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right, but I pushed those thoughts aside. After all, what could possibly go wrong? Jake left early the next morning, a briefcase containing $22,000 in cash securely tucked under his arm. I kissed him goodbye, a knot of anxiety twisting in my stomach. I asked him to be careful and to call me as soon as he was done. He nodded, giving me a reassuring smile, promising he had everything under control. Hours later, my phone buzzed with a text from Jake informing me of his arrival. I held my breath, waiting for his call. When it finally came, Jake's voice was filled with a mix of emotions as he recounted the events of his visit. Upon arriving at my parents' house, Jake found that neither of my parents was home. Instead, he was greeted by my sister, Sarah. Jake explained the purpose of his visit, stating that he had brought money intended for my mother. Sarah informed him that our mother had been admitted to the hospital, and our father had gone to visit her. She explained that they were borrowing this money to pay for our mother's operation. Despite the unexpected turn of events, Jake handed over the money to Sarah. After completing this task, he quickly excused himself and left. When Jake returned home, I was eager to hear about his trip. As he walked through the door, I rushed to greet him. Thank you for doing this, Jake. I'm sure it will help my mom a lot. There's something else, Jake added, looking a bit uncertain. Sarah wasn't alone in the house. There was a guy there. He looked like he was living there. I blinked in surprise. A guy living there? Mom never mentioned Sarah had a boyfriend, let alone one who moved in. Jake shrugged. Yeah, he seemed pretty comfortable. I was surprised too. I sat back, processing this new information. It was strange that my mother hadn't mentioned Sarah's boyfriend, but I brushed it off as just another example of our poor communication. Well, I'm just glad we could help with Mom's operation, I said finally. I hope she recovers quickly. As we sat there on the couch, I felt a mix of emotions. I was worried about my mother's health, but also grateful that we had been able to help. The presence of Sarah's boyfriend at my parents' house was unexpected, but I decided not to dwell on it. After all, my family's well-being was what mattered most right now. Every day, I'd call to check on my mother's progress, my heart racing each time, until I heard her voice. The operation went well, dear, she'd say, her tone reassuring. We're so grateful for your help. I'm feeling better already. Relief washed over me with each call, but a nagging feeling persisted in the back of my mind. Something felt off, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. A month passed, and I decided it was time to see for myself how my mother was doing. I took some time off work and made the journey back to my childhood home. When I arrived, I was surprised to find my mother already up and about, looking normal. There were no visible signs of her recent surgery, no hints of the illness that had allegedly threatened her life just weeks ago. Mom, I started hesitantly. How are you feeling after the operation? She waved her hand dismissively, avoiding my gaze. Oh, you know, much better. No need to worry about all that now. Would you like some tea? I wanted to press further, but seeing her bustling around the kitchen, 
I decided not to upset her. Maybe she just didn't want to relive the ordeal. My father was there too, doting on my young niece. Sarah, however, was conspicuously absent. Where's Sarah? I asked, watching my niece play with her toys. My mother's face lit up. Oh, Sarah's doing so well. She's got a job now, can you believe it? Work seven days a week, even spend some nights there. Such a hard worker. I couldn't hide my shock. This didn't sound like the sister I knew at all. That's quite a change, I said. People can surprise you, my mother said, a strange smile playing on her lips. I spent two days with my parents, playing with my niece and trying to reconnect with my family. But something felt off. There was an undercurrent of tension, whispered conversations that would stop when I entered the room. Finally, it was time for me to head back home. As I drove, my mind wandered, trying to make sense of the strange visit. On a whim, I pulled over at a rest stop and decided to check social media. I hadn't bothered in a while, given how distant. I became aware of my family's deceit as I scrolled through Sarah's profile. My heart stopped. There, in vibrant color, were photos of my sister in a white gown, beaming next to a man I recognized as the one Jake had seen at the house. The caption read, Just married. Thanks mom and dad for the amazing wedding and dream honeymoon. The pieces suddenly fell into place with sickening clarity. The money, the rushed need for cash, the evasive answers about the operation. It had all been a lie. My vision blurred as the reality of the situation hit me. Without thinking, I flung open the car door and stumbled out, gasping for air. The cool breeze did little to calm the storm of emotions raging inside me. Betrayal, anger, hurt. They all swirled together. I leaned against my car, trying to steady myself. With shaking hands, I pulled out my phone and dialed my mother's number. Each ring felt like an eternity until finally she answered. Nina, is everything all right? Her voice was casual, as if nothing was wrong. Mom, I managed, my voice trembling. I need you to be honest with me. What happened to the money we sent for your operation? There was a long pause on the other end of the line. When she spoke again, her tone had changed. Nana, you have to understand, there was no operation. We gave the money to Sarah for her wedding. The confirmation hit me like a physical blow. How could you? I whispered. Your sister finally met a good man, my mother explained, her voice taking on a defensive edge. We couldn't leave her without a proper wedding gift. This was her chance at happiness. Tears streamed down my face as I spoke. Do you have any idea how hard I worked for that money? How many nights I stayed up? How many weekends I gave up. Jake and I were saving that for our own wedding. There was a moment of silence before my mother responded, her voice cold and indifferent. You're smart, Nana. You can always earn more. Her callous response sparked a fire of anger within me. I want the money back, I demanded. All of it. Now. To my shock, my mother laughed a harsh, mirthless sound that sent chills down my spine. Oh, Nina, she said, her voice dripping with condescension. You can't prove you gave us any money. What? I gasped. Jake brought it to you? He gave it to Sarah? Did he now? My mother's voice was sickeningly sweet. That's not how I remember it. If you try to take this to court, I'll tell them your boyfriend is a fraud, that he took the money for himself, and never gave us a cent. I felt like I was going to be sick. You wouldn't, I said. Try me? It's your word against ours, dear, she challenged. And let's face it, who would believe the daughter who's barely spoken to her family in years over her poor, struggling sister and her devoted parents? The line died before I could say anything further. My mother's words echoed in my ears as I looked at my phone in shock. Their betrayal was astounding in its extent. They had not only misled and embezzled from me, but now they were threatening to expose Jake as a criminal in the event that I attempted to retrieve the money. 
with my legs failing to hold me up, I collapsed onto my car. How had things ended up here? In the worst way imaginable, my own family, the ones who were meant to love and support me without conditions, had deceived and exploited me. Still reeling from the chat with my mother, I staggered through the door of our apartment. Jake appeared out of nowhere, his expression full of concern. Pointing me toward the couch, he said, Naina, what happened? I described everything, the wedding pictures, the phone conversation, and my mother's nasty remarks and threats, while crying. Jake surrounded me with his arms, offering me silent comfort as he listened closely. After I was done, Jake inhaled deeply. Softly, he remarked, I had a feeling something wasn't right about that whole situation. I took some precautions because of this. Jake got to his feet and went to get his laptop. He clarified, Before I went to your parents' house, I bought a hidden camera. I suspected we would require documentation of what transpired. Jake opened a video file, and my eyes grew wide. It was as apparent as day that Jake was giving Sarah the money on the television. Sarah's voice could be heard counting the cash and saying it was for our mother's surgery. I muttered, Jake, you're brilliant. He gave my hand a squeeze. We can demonstrate what actually occurred with this. Nor can your mother attempt to refute it or accuse me of being a fraud. We met with a lawyer the following day. She had looked over our evidence and thought we had a good case. The process won't be quick, she forewarned us. These processes require time, but I think we can win with this video. Jake turned to face me as we left the attorney's office. He remarked, You know, we don't have to put our lives on hold while this works out. Why don't we tie the knot right now? I gave him a startled look. However, what about the lavish wedding we had in mind? Jake gave a head shake. That is unimportant. It matters that we begin our lives together. For that, a grandiose celebration is not necessary. We worked over the following few weeks to organize a small, private ceremony. Even though it wasn't the extravagant celebration we had planned, I recognized it was the right moment as I stood there saying my vows to Jake in front of our closest friends. My family was conspicuously absent. I hadn't informed them about the wedding or given them a call. Even though it hurt, I understood that it was best. There was a weight lifted off my shoulders as Jake and I danced for the first time as a married couple. Yes. The agony from my family's betrayal was still raw, and there was still a legal battle to fight. However, I had hope for the future right now, surrounded by people who genuinely loved and supported me. After several months, we eventually took my mother to court in our lawsuit. The judge's expression of surprise and incredulity was visible as we presented our evidence, which included Jake's video footage. My mother's attempts to portray us as liars were exposed by indisputable evidence. My phone rang the day the verdict was made public. My mother was there. She shouted, her voice brimming with rage. How dare you! This is how you pay us back for all that we have done for you. You are a resentful child. I said nothing while she rantingly enumerated all the alleged sacrifices they had made for me as a child. Her words had the power to shatter me to my core, but now they felt hollow. She spit out, I hope you're happy. You are no longer my daughter as of right now. To me, you are dead. Before I could reply, the call ended. I was experiencing both agony and, strangely, relief as I stood there with my phone in my hand. My mother was mandated by the court to reimburse the $22,000. Later on, I found out she had to borrow money to pay for it. Life went on. Jake and I set aside the tension in my family to concentrate on our work and our shared lives. However, word continued to spread amongst acquaintances. It seems that Sarah's marriage was not at all like the idyllic picture she had imagined. While she and her spouse were staying with our parents, the house was always a party place. 
Its boisterous and inebriated behavior infuriated the neighbors. Everything came to a head when my parents' spouse attempted to evict Sarah and her husband from their own house while intoxicated. They summoned the police, and the grim reality of their predicament was made public. The last straw was that Sarah's careless actions cost her custody of her daughter. When my parents finally saw how much damage Sarah had caused, they ejected Sarah and her husband. They decided to provide their granddaughter with a stable environment, something Sarah was unable to do, so they brought her in. My phone rang with a known number just as I was about to close that chapter of my life forever. In defiance of my better judgment, I replied. My mother's voice was softer than I had heard in years when she said, Nina, you are missed. I remained silent, biding my time for the other shoe to fall. It wasn't very long. We require your assistance, she went on, with bringing up your niece. It's challenging, and we're getting older. A wave of deja vu passed over me as she spoke. Indeed, history was repeating itself. They were attempting to convince me to take care of Sarah's child, even though they had previously preferred Sarah above me. I apologize, I stated firmly. I am unable to assist you. However, she's your niece, my mother argued. Do you not value your family? I inhaled deeply. I hope my niece has a happy life. She is innocent in all of this. However, you are still the same. You're still attempting to have me correct your errors. I refuse to participate. Please don't call me back.